What's up guys? Joe Munoz, OneStepPrep.com. Welcome to another video from the studio. Man, I haven't recorded anything in the studio for a minute. And uh, we've just been busy handling all kinds of stuff, including in-person training. And if you haven't been here, then you need to ask yourself, where am I at that I'm not over there with One Step Prep? All right. On a serious note, I want to share with you, I've got two models here in this video. Um, and what we're going to talk about is some of the challenges you might face if you are transitioning from, let's say, an RJ, a Gulfstream, a Hawker, a BeachJet 400, really anything that has the engines mounted on the tail. This is a CRJ 700 model. You can tell it's a tail mounted engine as opposed to an underwing mounted engine. This is a 787 model, but it could very well be a 73, a 320, a 74, a triple, an A340. What other, what other sevens do we have? 71, no, seven, 717 is actually a, uh, what's that, 76? 717 is a tail mounted engine. We got Diego in the house. Diego's our director of sales. We got Alexis next door. Monica, the record keeping. JD, Juan Dominguez, your friends in training program success. All right, let's talk, let's talk. Uh, first and foremost, okay, the um, CRJ, okay, has center line thrust. This is also true of most corporate jets. The Hawker, okay, uh, 800, um, whatever. Your, uh, your Beach Jet 400, your Citation, you know, Citation 10, your CJ3, like a gentleman that I just did some training with and he had a little bit of issue. Had he looked up some of these videos beforehand, we would have saved him a lot of headache. So I'm glad you're here watching this. So let's talk about this, okay? The CRJ 800, uh, 700 has the centerline thrust. Now here's two things, very, very crucial, you're gonna run into with centerline thrust issue. V1 cut uh, directional control, okay? The reason for that is because you will notice there is a larger lever arm between obviously the center of the aircraft out to the engine as opposed to here we got center line thrust so essentially if an engine fails here you're not going to feel it very much if an engine fails here you're going to feel, uh, feel it quite a bit that's true on the v1 cut and more so it's also true on the go around where we typically experience in training and also checking we oftentimes will give you engine failures during go around if you have an underwing mounted engine like this, you're going to experience quite the need for a, a lot more rudder pressure than what you would expect on the centerline thrust. Now, <clears throat> here's another thing for you to consider. Thrust application on the engines mounted under the uh, wing like this, thrust application results in a considerable nose up tendency and likewise thrust reduction in a considerable nose down tendency. Now, the reason this is large, a large consideration for you is because <clears throat> when you're doing your stall recovery, a lot of times, uh, what we find is we revert to what we were taught in Private Pilot 101, which is to quote unquote power your way out of the stall, meaning you need full power and you need nose down elevator application to recover from a stall. Well, I'm going to say that A, that's not always the case, and B, furthermore, I'm going to say that let's think about a glider for a second, right? If you're flying a glider, can, can a glider stall? Yes. Can a glider recover from the stall? Yes. Does a glider have thrust? No. So what does that tell you about thrust required for stall recovery? You don't need any, right? You don't need any and because it's an entirely uh, a function of angle of attack reduction more so than thrust application. So what happens in training for, for the candidates that are coming from a centerline uh, thrust and real, real uh, moreover, the tail mounted engine is that your thrust application here is not going to give you as aggressive as a nose up or a nose down tendency with thrust application or reduction. So ultimately, when you recover from the stall and you apply the same principle that you've been doing here for so many years over here, the thrust application is going to drive your nose up into uh, potentially a secondary stall, which is predominantly what we're trying to avoid doing. We don't want a secondary stall. So what I would share with you for those of you making the transition over is to be, and really in any airplane, if, if you're flying a plane, you need to be mindful that thrust needed for stall recovery is, it's not needed. That's the fact of the matter, right? It is needed for, for altitude loss minimalization. So in order to minimize altitude loss, I'll need thrust but it's not necessarily recovered, uh, needed for the actual recovery from the stall. Furthermore, to go a little bit deeper, those of you transitioning to the underwing mounted engine like this on a 320, 73, 74, 75, 76, triple, A380, A340, A3, new A3, something that they're gonna come out with, whatever it is, um, you're not really gonna need a whole lot of thrust. In fact, if you do apply a lot of thrust, what's gonna happen is it could potentially drive you into a secondary stall. Let's talk about steep turns, okay? When I enter into the steep turn here, as I pass through 30 degrees of bank, I'm gonna need a little bit of a thrust bump. If you log on to onestepprep.com, a quick little shameless plug, onestepprep.com, 
we have all this on video, the briefing, whiteboard briefing, and then also in the sim, you see me flying it and talking to you. And passing 30 degrees of bank, you're gonna to need to apply not only a little bit of aft elevator input, but also a little bit of thrust. And when you apply the thrust, that's gonna drive my nose up just a little bit, right? As opposed to doing it on a uh, tail mounted engine over here, that thrust application in a steep turn isn't really gonna do a whole lot for us. Other than keep speed, it doesn't do a whole lot for our pitch, right? So what I'm getting at is there are some aerodynamic uh, differences in terms of characteristics. Okay, there's some characteristics, aerodynamic characteristics that you would expect for these two different um, <clears throat> aircraft solely because of where the engines are mounted. And the two primary things, there's a couple others that we can get into. I think it might go beyond the scope of the video, but certainly what I want to share with you, the two primary ones is that centerline thrust here and tail mounted engines are potentially going to uh, not be of too much help when you discover that here I need a lot more rudder for my single engine operation and I need to be ready for these nose up and nose down tendencies. Same by the way is true for the unusual attitudes. Let's just uncover that for a second. If I'm nose high unusual attitude with a lot of thrust, right? Well think about it, a lot of thrust application holds my nose up, right? Now thrust almost always in an unusual attitude recovery is essentially recommended to be used as required. Well, what does as required mean, right? Well, there's a lot of ways for us to rebuild energy and thrust is not the only way to do so. In fact, thrust could be a hindrance if I'm nose high trying to get down to a nose low position. So you're gonna find there's a couple schools of thought when it comes to unusual attitude recovery, one of which is have the flight path vector on and unload down to the flight path vector. That's a lot of EET or extended envelope training otherwise known as UPRT, Upset Prevention Recovery Training. Got a whole course on that, by the way, onestepprep.com, it's included in the course. Okay, we talk about that, unloading to the flight path vector, otherwise known as the bird, those of you that fly the Airbus. But thrust may be a hindrance here because it's holding my nose up when I'm trying to get my nose down, right? So we can introduce some other things in order to help us do that. It's not gonna be so much the case if we're over here with the tail uh, mounted engine because the thrust application here really isn't gonna do a whole lot for holding my nose up. And likewise, the thrust reduction isn't gonna necessarily have the tendency to bring the nose down the same way it would over here. So it's interesting because I had a, um, <clears throat> a relatively um, a long but very productive phone call recently with several potential candidates and they were all asking me a couple of questions. How do I know the training's gonna work for me? How do I know your videos are gonna work for me? How do I know that um, I should invest in, in myself in this? And are you gonna know right away you know, whether I'm gonna be able to make it through a program or not? So I'm just gonna share with you a couple of things. Okay, the first thing is, um, I've been running sims for a very long time. I run more sims than flight planes, just to be honest with you. So basically when I see you in a sim or in a ground school environment, based on our interaction together, I'm gonna know right away where your weak points are. It's almost like the doctor, right? You literally walk in, that's why we call this the clinic, man. I'm gonna give you your prescriptions. Brother and sister, we're the Walgreens of the aviation industry. CVS is in the house, okay? So when you come in and, and we have a, um, ground school together or an FTD or a full flight sim, I'm gonna know immediately based on how you're responding to questions, how you're uh, retaining what I'm giving you and how you're performing overall, what the recommended prescription for you is and how well of a recovery process you're gonna have, okay? In other words, I can, I can tell you, if you come from corporate background, center line thrust, you're probably gonna have a couple of issues, one of which is the stall recovery, the steep turns, the V1 cut, the single engine operations as a whole, the pushback sequence, because you've never parked at a gate, cockpit to ground, go ahead, push complete, set parking brake, show us the pin, that whole sequence you've never dealt with, you're probably gonna have some issue there. All we gotta do is introduce one failure that's gonna require an amendment in a 121 airline, and you're not gonna know what that term is, so you're probably gonna have some issue there. We got a course for that, by the way. Um, if you're military background, flying F-18s, you're used to flying, checklists, radios, everything on your own, so we're gonna have to divide up the tasks, pilot monitoring, pilot flying, what's the MCP or the F FCU in the case of a 320 etiquette, who's on the radios, who's running an ECAM, who's talking to the passengers and the flight attendants, that whole thing's gotta be broken down for you. Uh, if you're coming from a seaplane background, you haven't tracked a center line, I had a case like this recently, you're gonna have an issue tracking center line. Like if you come from chopper background, your energy management's gonna be an issue because you're used to hovering, now you're in a 320, it's gonna feel like a, like a train with no brakes. Like, you can pretty much name every scenario. I've probably seen it. I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't wanna to generalize to that degree, but obviously I keep seeing more and more scenarios, but what I'm getting at is we've been in this game for a little while. We have seen quite a few things. I can assure you if you call in here um, and tell us your background, I'll probably put together a solution for you, for sure. Regardless of where you're at, where you're trying to go, 
will put together some path that's ultimately going to lead to your success. There's basically three things required to have you succeed. One, you need to make a decision that you want to do something. So in order for you to make a decision that you want to do something, there's three things that need to be required. Okay, I'm going to break this down. First thing is you need awareness of yourself that you need help. You need to admit that you need help. And then finally, you need to take action. Now, the action would be call One Step Prep or send us an email. So you send it over here, at which point you've already made a commitment to yourself. Now you need an instructor who's going to make a commitment to you. So by the way, the instructor group that you run into here are very much committed to you. So if you're committed and we're committed and we have time, these are the three ingredients, your commitment, our commitment, and time. 100% you're going to have success in the training program of your choosing. But we need those three things. Now a lot of times what happens is we have those first two ingredients. You're committed, otherwise you wouldn't be calling in or sending an email. We're certainly committed to your success, but we run out of time because you didn't call us fast enough. So what I do want to, want to tell you is don't short yourself on the time. Make sure you call ahead of time and book so that A, you have enough time to retain everything. B, we can realistically book classes and sim sessions which are filling up like I can't even tell you how much they're filling up. And so if you can have the awareness, admit, take action, stay committed, come to a committed organization and do it with ample time, you will succeed 100% in your training program success. All right, so hope you found value in the video. Hope this makes sense to you. Uh, as always, we're very much available to answer your questions and what have you. Uh, you guys know the name, Juan. Enjoy your friends in training program success, onestepprep.com. Click there, scroll down a little bit to, uh, it's not quite in the middle of the page, but just a, a, you know, a few scrolls down, you're gonna find everything we offer, including online courses, prep courses, 142 courses, training in Spanish, whatever. We'll get it all done and we'll put together a success plan for you and get to work. So, I'll leave you with that. As always, like, share, subscribe, comment, drop your comments below, even your critiques. It's all good, brother and sister. You can share some love with some criticism. It's all good, all right? And we'll see you here in another video shortly. Cut. <laughs>